How's it going? It's going shitty, but we're here anyway. Yeah, well, we will make it better by talking about Percy Jackson. <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah, so, I mean, there was two very action-filled chapters back to back which like i know our ultimate pur purpose is talking about the show eventually so it's interesting if they're going to make this all into one episode because the episodes in the first season were multiple chapters packed into one mm -hmm. they are probably gonna have to because there's just like sea of monsters is the shortest book like, but there's a lot more like actiony stuff like this that needs to happen, and I don't know how they could skip any of the stuff that happened in this chapter before yeah, going yeah. actually out there because of how important it is to the story. Like the chariot race feels like it's gonna have to be its own episode, and then the um, chapter seven was the um, quest starting out part and yeah that feels like it's gonna be its own and i'm so looking forward to Aryan on the dream sequences <laughs> yeah that's gonna be really funny i hope that there's somehow more yeah so just so he's in it more until they actually find him just like him randomly popping in on Aryan in a wedding dress weaving yeah that's gonna be the joy of his freaking life being able to wear wedding. He's so excited about getting to wear a wedding dress. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> I love how easy to trick Polyphemus was. And um, I mean, it's on brand. They allude to what had happened with Polyphemus in the Odyssey by saying he's still partially blind because of someone who poked his eye. Um, mm -hmm. Very obviously, you know, poking at like, Odysseus was the one who did this. Um, and I love that they say it while he is literally being tricked again. And being tricked in a similar way to how Penelope tricked her suitors. I do love that we get like very honest commentary from Percy on uh, Tyson suddenly being his brother. Mm -hmm. And like what that means for him socially in camp, but also like, you know, he's having mixed emotions about it because he's always felt protective over this kid. But mm -hmm. now, like, it's, he's no longer the, the guy who fetched the lightning, he's Tyson's brother. Yeah, and I liked how they did that because sometimes people will try to be, it's just, like, sometimes people in, like, fandom stuff, they, they do, like, trends or whatever about, like, sad things or whatever. And I've noticed as of late that it seems like there's like this weird trend of people trying to take things that Percy did out of context to make it sound like he's a worse person than he actually is. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm sorry, dudes, but no. And so like one of the things that I've noticed when it comes to that is trying to make it sound like he treats Tyson worse than he does in this book. And it's like, you guys understand that like literally the entire camp is making fun of him. Yeah. And not just making fun of him, but being like, oh, you're a, you're related to a monster. The things that we have spent our entire lives trying to run away from. Mm -hmm. And like, I want you to know what it's like if you don't know what this was like when you were in school to have literally the entire school hating you and making fun of you for something that you can't help and then see how you would respond. Like he doesn't like it because it's like everyone is suddenly looking down on me and I don't know what to do about this. Yeah. He's still, um, but he still, you know, protects Tyson. Like mm -hmm. he's still like, he's not actually a monster. Like just stop doing this. And especially when it comes to the fact that of his dad, like yeah. one part of this that I liked was him saying like, I feel like Poseidon did this to like make fun of me or to hurt me in some way he doesn't understand why he would do that because yeah why would he do that like why would you claim um like everyone sees as a monster as his brother and like have that be the only other poseidon person that you know of like that automatically puts him in a bad like a, a precarious like social and just like precarious position in this world when monsters are the thing that everyone agrees upon yeah. usually as like the bad thing and that's like that's very that's a very rational thing for a 13 year old kid 
to feel that he doesn't want everyone to look down on him or think that he's a bad person. And especially because of Tyson. It's yeah. like out of everybody you're thinking he's bad because have you met Tyson? Like the like the sweetest little being ever and that somehow the thing that makes it and it's I mean it's consistent like I said this in the last episode but I really like how they don't act like the Greek world and camp is like this perfect place mm-hmm. like they talk about how it has and showing it aggressively through this sort of thing that there's like a lot of that people at camp are just as susceptible to being shitty as outside of this world like it's not like a it's not perfect like there's they're showing that there's problems at camp as well um it happens in the next book too in like the when it comes to going on the quest like the same kind of general issues comes up as well and they're also giving him shit in the next book for something completely different at camp. Mm-hmm. And so he's in a very hard position there, but he un- honestly, he does the best that he can with that difficult position that his that the world is kind of putting him in. Yeah. Uh, like he gets a, in a whole argument with Annabeth um, over Tyson, which he I'm glad that he did because she was being ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah. like like he doesn't talk to his best friend for a couple of days because he's defending Tyson. Um, he's doing a he's a, doing a much better job than most people who knew me when I yeah. was in school. <laughs> well, and it's it's getting mad at him for thought crimes essentially because it's like yes he's he's thinking these things he's mulling over how he feels about this new situation, but he's not taking it out on Tyson. Like he's still very careful about the things he says in front of him. He's still very careful about the words he uses because Tyson's starting to catch on that everybody's calling him monster. And yeah, uh, yeah and when he questions, like, am I a monster? It's okay, I'll be a good monster. Oh my gosh, like. Uh, I died. Yeah. Of how T- Percy was just like, no, 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 no. And like, and him thinking that Percy is mad at him and just assuming that he's the problem percy is mad at literally everyone else <laughs> except him tice is the only one that he's not mad at it, literally everyone else around him except for tyson yeah. and it, a poor, that was just horrible and i forget what part it is exactly in this chapter but the part when tyson where people are saying that because there's this one part when he has like the dream about Grover and when he wakes up and he hears Tyson talk he mentions how it like throws him off for a second because Tyson sounds similar to Polythemus how they just how they talk Mm -hmm. and like the dream and I forget if it's Annabeth or somebody else they say something to Tyson basically about how oh because he's a cyclops he like has to be like evil and, and or doing something really bad to people somebody says something like that. And that just reminds me so much of what it's like when you're related to somebody who's a horrible person and just being like, but I'm not horrible. That's essentially like Tyson. Um, Like I know very much what this is like. I look like my very abusive dad. Sometimes I can't look at my face on like certain days, especially after therapy. I usually can't look at my face because I look like him. And sometimes when I talk, I sound like him and it's I'm nothing like him. But there's nothing that's going to stop me from looking like I'm like, I'm autistic because he was autistic. Like there's things about me that just genetically are connected to that person, no matter what I want to be true. I wish it wasn't, but that's my dad. There's nothing I can do about that. And exactly like Tyson, he did not decide to be born. Yeah. Like he did not make Poseidon decide to do this and have him be born. And so he looks like maybe beings out there that have hurt demigods before, but he hasn't. And so it's like, it's that whole, like the whole thing that Rick Riordan does of showing like the things that happen in our world, just making it like a magical way to, to show these things. But that's definitely something that people experience. And it's not fair to hold Tyson responsible for something that someone else he's never met before did. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I, I love how much he's developed. So I get mixed up with Harry Potter, our continual comparison with fandom's idea of Sirius Black and what Sirius Black actually is. Mm -hmm. Um, Because in a way he kind of has that thing going on where it's like, 
you know, my whole family has been in Slytherins and yes. Death Eaters. Um, you know, they have been historically on the pure blood mentality side, um, but I'm not. And um, they don't, they don't in actual canon, Harry Potter developed that a lot, but like the fandom has developed it enough that like Sirius feels like a richer character than he actually mm -hmm. is. Um, mm -hmm. And Tyson is actually fully developed in that way of like, yes. my whole lineage is kind of fucked, but I'm one of the good ones. Yeah, and in these chapters, like I, when I was reading it, I was like, why are horses, horses, horses why are horses nicer to him than humans yeah. like when the horses don't trust him because he's a cyclops and all percy has to say is i'll give you sugar and they're like okay and they're and they're fine with him being in the chariot with him his best friend though nope and everyone else at camp no <laughs> yeah he, animals are nicer to tyson and he's supposed to be the monster okay all right like that's sure sure <laughs> yeah <sighs> yeah I, 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 the whole thing with annabeth was i really liked that particularly because she is seven thousand percent wrong mm -hmm. like that's i that's why i like i like that whole storyline with her and tyson in this book because as the book goes along she is proven to be she literally it's not physically possible for he to, for her to be more wrong about tyson than she actually is. And she gets there eventually as the book goes along. Like, I honestly can't remember if she realizes it before he, before they think he sacrificed himself for them or not. Hopefully she does because yeah, that sucks. <laughs> if she doesn't, if it takes that much for her to realize it or not. But even though she, it's one of those things that happens is that sometimes when you're traumatized by something, if you like don't, acknowledge it or whatever it can make you're the asshole <laughs> like you're the asshole of that situation because you're letting somebody else who reminds you of that person affect how you treat them and it's not fair because i really that's why i really liked that argument they had because i'm like percy is a hundred percent in the right like there's end of story like that's it like annabeth could not be more wrong she's afraid of this cyclops in front of her that cries and wants peanut butter and just wants to help everybody because of one that scared her and tried to hurt her when she was seven and that's a very valid thing to happen but it's also showing like it's messing up her friendship with percy yeah because he's like no like tyson has not done anything there's no reason not to like him he hasn't actually done anything wrong and like she even is just sitting there trying to call him a monster like in front of Tyson and he and per Percy's like no like I thought I thought you let him in camp because he saved my life and it's like well yeah okay so why are you a why are you calling him a monster then if he saved my life what is wrong with him then if that's what he did that's the only thing you know about him is that he cares about me and he's here because he cares about me and he helped me not die and so why is he a monster again? Like, there's no actual reason for it besides just like the prejudice, basically, of thinking that because he's this thing, he ha there has to be something wrong with him. It also shows Annabeth's character that she can't just be told she's wrong. She needs nope. to actually experience it. And that is a trend <laughs> throughout the books. Oh my God. It's her whole fatal flaw thing. That like she thinks that she knows better than everybody, and so when she realizes that she's wrong about something, it's like literally pulling like teeth to try to get her to just accept it. Like, and it's a very like uniquely Annabeth kind of um, personality trait. Like, when Percy's wrong, he'll admit it like right away, and he's like, "Yeah, okay, fine. Like, I I'm wrong about that." Or he kind of assumes sometimes that he might not be correct about things. Um, but with her, it's it's like literally like a battle. <laughs> I can be like that a bit. Like there was, I remember first time reading these books, Annabeth being the character I identified with the most. I think that's probably a lot of girls though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, okay. Let's see. So um, we see a little bit of how camp is going now that Tantalus is the director and 
Um, it's not going great. <laughs> and no. we have a secret underground security system like that the kids are doing, the patrol system. Of course. Because yeah. they don't want anyone to die. And I think like there's little details in there where you can tell even Dionysus is getting fed up with him. So, um, you know, everybody's starting to realize this situation is so fucked. Like, yeah. And um, it's interesting how well they're working together because it's not really said, but you know that the Aries camp is working with like everybody else to get this done, knowing that Clarice was the one who was kind of in charge of it before. Mm -hmm. It's, I like, one moment from that security thing with Percy I liked was him just sitting there and when he's by himself mm -hmm. and just thinking about how this is all Luke's fault and I hate this because this is Luke's fault and there's like literally like three paragraphs or something into the first chapter that we read he's like everyone keeps comparing me to Luke and I'm like oh that's interesting <laughs> Like, and saying, like, oh, everyone says you're, a, like, the best sword fighter, except for Luke. And everything he does, they compare what he does to Luke. And that's, I said all of that stuff about him trying to handle um, how people respond to Tyson being his brother. But that's a good thing to bring up, is that everyone keeps comparing him to a murderer, or like, an attempted murderer in the best. At this point he's probably killed somebody at this point we just don't know about it but like the worst person the yeah. absolute worst person and like percy even says it in this chapter like how angry he is remembering that he acted like he was his friend when the entire time he was not percy in this chapter has grasped like luke better than most characters do for three four more books and the fandom at large he gets them better than his own fandom at this point. <laughs> like, I see a lot of people trying to be like, oh, Luke had a point. Or, oh, Luke and Percy were friends and then things didn't work. No. You, you're not a friend with someone if you're trying to kill them the entire time you're trying to talk to them. That's not a friendship. When I was reading these chapters, I was just like, yeah, that's pretty much Percy's story in this book. Like, every character kind of has a general thing in their story that they're kind of getting through. And oh Percy's God. general kind of thing is... It sounds harsh as heck, but he's basically getting put into horrible situations because nobody believes him about yeah. Luke. And he's right about him, but nobody else is on board with that. And so be he's basically forced to go through horrible things in order to prove to other people what he already knows himself. And it's just this ironic thing as the books go along that he is the one that feels the most responsible for mm -hmm. the things that Luke does to other kids and to other people and to him and to Annabeth. And like he holds so much responsibility for any of that. And none of that is actually his fault because he's known what's going on from the beginning. It's that nobody else does. <laughs> yeah. But it's just hard to think about. Like, can you imagine like someone um, betraying you that way and trying to kill you? And then everyone at camp is either making fun of you because your brother is like basically a disabled allegory or they're comparing you to the person who tried to kill you and it's like yeah. that is so that is so hard that's like if somebody every time somebody saw me they were like oh you remind you like your dad did this and your dad did that and it'd be like that's nice do you want to die or something <laughs> like why would you bring that up <laughs> yeah like meanwhile he's literally looking at the scorpion sting on his hand like Mm -hmm. literally still has the scar from almost being killed by him just like it's a total disconnect of and that very relatable for anyone who's ever been scapegoated at all like whether it's from a family or a job or friends or anything but that's very much his what he's feeling in in these these few chapters before they even go out on the quest is feeling like i know what's going on like i know that luke can't be saved but nobody else seems to get that. And I, and it's part of the thing that's hard about that is like, he tried to kill him. He like almost very closely got away. Like even the show versus book version is the same in the way that it was very close to him dying in both versions of that scene with Luke, even if it was different, like the, the, it doesn't matter that there isn't a scorpion in the show. And it, it must be so hard to know that 
all of these people in this world that you just helped and they say that they care about you it's not like almost clicking to them like i almost was killed by this person yeah and you're still looking up to them as like they're a hero um but they tried to kill me why don't you care that they that he tried to kill me like what what do i have to do to prove that he's bad if you don't care if he tried to take me off of this planet when i was 12 like what else could somebody do besides something like that to show that there that there's no saving him and i know that this it's the whole setup of this world that luke is seen as like the golden child mm -hmm. and so they don't want to see him like that they want there to be something wrong with percy instead but it's just a really harsh thing that he has to go through it's a thing that i mean admitting this is one of the reasons why as golden children have so much trouble healing is that mm -hmm being exceptionally good at something and being everybody's friend is a way to manipulate situations it 100 percent is and so luke becoming the best sword fighter luke being the welcoming leader of the hermes cabin where everybody ends up until they get claimed like there is a lot of power in that that he gained throughout the years and so all of those people who he's manipulated who he's made friends with or made feel welcome somehow are now just like oh maybe he's under some sort of spell or they they must think something like that you know because mm -hmm. the greek mythology world is not above that type of magic where you could be like magically manipulated into something um so yeah, it, it reminds me a lot of um, victims of abuse in our reality mm -hmm. like wanting to shake people into realizing that abusive people are not what you think they look like mm -hmm. um they're not they 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 wouldn't get away with it if they all looked like a scary weird like homeless person living in a van down by the river or whatever people imagine abusive people to look like they look like normal people they have normal jobs they look like nice people sometimes sometimes they are nice to certain people and it just reminds me of that like anger i always feel especially whenever there's like some big story in the news that it's like why this person gave off so many signals and so many signs that there was something happening under the surface as but especially even after the fact you find out about it and it's like why can't you see what's clearly why do you why do you fight so hard because you just want to believe that that somebody like this like a good looking like privileged kid in this world you know someone who knows a lot of people that's gone on two different quests that is loved by everyone would turn against everyone in this way like it's not and it like how percy is treated especially in this book um like the things he experiences because of that uh, it kind of reiterates that whole thing of it only hurts the victim when you won't just like get over your own bullshit and realize what's going on because that's purely what it is like you don't you don't want to admit it like that's nice but we're the ones that actually pay the price for your like you not wanting to admit that this is how the world works mm -hmm. like i don't care that you don't want to admit that this is how it is this is how it is maybe get over that instead of making victims tell you over and over and over and over again what happened and like because it's ridiculous as these books go on how many times percy has to be like luke tried to kill me luke tried to kill me again he tried to kill me again he once again tried to kill me after kidnapping my best friend and also tried to torture and kill her and like just over and over and over again and it's like how many times does everyone need to hear the same thing before they would just admit it instead of thinking that there's a failure within like percy mm -hmm. just can we get over this <laughs> we no we can't this is people are very caught up on that but it's one of those things like it makes sense for this to happen in this world because that's what people do in the real world uh mm -hmm. but it just is aggravating to to read it <laughs> yeah and i i hate to say it but it's probably only gonna get worse because charlie is pretty good looking <laughs> like yep yep it's it's i think it's so funny that that like i understand like liking charlie the actor he seems like a very nice guy i think it's absolutely like beyond hilarious that the cast call his calls him grandpa when he is 20 years old <laughs> he's not even fully 20 yet he's 20 in like a month or something um but like he's such a baby himself still but he is somehow the oldest one um when he's 20. 
And so I love that. Like, it's very sweet hearing the stories about how he tries to take care of these kids and help them along um, and, and, and all that kind of stuff, which that's very good. They need somebody like that. And, but at the same time, you can love Charlie the actor and also not let that mesh with the character he's playing because Charlie the actor is very much not Luke in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be able to play him if he was. Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't be at Disneyland with the kids. The chariot race was interesting. Yeah. Um, it was interesting that it was interesting to see that like that Annabeth and Percy were on like opposite teams because it was interesting to hear Percy just be like, I just I don't want to talk to her. Like, I don't to like ask for help from something because I'm just like done with her for the moment. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it was the the stuff with Tantalus is just I, I I'm like imagining how that's going to look in the show. I'm just mostly imagining the part where he like tells everybody why he's cursed. And I'm like, you have to be like insane to tell like a bunch of children like, oh, I'm cursed because I fed the gods my own children. Mm -hmm. For shits and giggles, just to like see what they would do, not even for like an actual reason. Like just as like a fun experiment, I wanted to see what the gods would do if they ate humans. And I decided the nearest humans was my own children. So I just like fed them my kids. And somehow during this entire discussion, he thinks that he's the one that's being wronged somehow. <laughs> and it's like, I, this is like a very rare circumstance where I think the god's punishment is just fine. Yes. Like, it's kind of almost tame, considering what he did. Like, you, ki you killed your own kids and and thought that, like, the gods wouldn't be that upset about that. Like, what did you think would happen after they ate your children, that they would just be like, oh, that's fine? It's very that's poetically just, because he does <laughs> food-related crimes, and so he has a food-related punishment. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I feel like Rick included him... A, for the, he doesn't give a fuck about kids aspect, but B, because of the physical comedy of just food rolling away from him and he's just not paying attention to the campers because he's trying to eat something. The whole thing with the chariot race is just like, what is happening here? It reminds me of, of when Umbridge was in Harry Potter where there is obvious, like ridiculous things happening. But in, at, unlike Harry Potter, the kids at this camp know that like what is going on here <laughs> like what is what is happening this cannot be this is very strange that like in the middle of the chariot races some like demon birds attack everyone like including the innocent people that are just watching mm -hmm. and everyone but clarice basically stops to help people so they're not just like taken out yeah and like Clarice yells at them like why are you leaving and it's like yeah that's Percy and Annabeth they're definitely going to abandon everybody in the, when they need help that's definitely what's going on here but like Clarice basically wins because he likes Aries I'm pretty sure that Aries is like working with him in some way um I can't remember this complete we'll find out like in the next next week for sure but I'm pretty sure that's what's happening but even if it's not he just likes Clarice because he would <laughs> and, and like names her the victor of the chariot race because she's the only one that hides instead of trying to help somebody and trying to help them and it's like how does this work that percy and annabeth are the ones that actually save everybody but she's the one that is named like the champion yeah and then gets to and especially the whole thing with um one thing I really like with Percy is how he he's intelligent, but he in ways that isn't like stereotypically intelligent. And so there's like there's one part of this chap the one part of this chapter when Annabeth is explaining to him what the golden fleece is. Like he's saying like sarcastic comments that I would say of like, oh, like when she's talking about Jason and the Argonauts and he's like, oh, like that old movie. And she's like, oh my god, I am so done with it. He is doing that to piss her off on purpose. Because I'm like, yeah, that's what that's what I do. But like, if I if someone's talking to me with, like, and they don't, and they're talking to me like I'm an idiot, then I'm going to make jokes like I am an idiot, <laughs> even though I'm not. Like, try me. I'm going to act like I don't know what I'm, what, 
what you're saying right now because it's more fun to watch me get annoyed, watch you get annoyed with me than to just tell you that I know what you're talking about. And then the other part was when they're thinking about how to tell him about the their quest idea. Ooh. And Percy is smart enough to know, like, we can't just tell, we have to basically manipulate him by using peer pressure. And if we tell him when we're, when we're doing like the camp out stuff, when everyone else is there, then he'll have to give in and let us leave, which is what happens, except that he randomly gives the quest to Clarice instead. And it's like, what, what the heck is going on? And this is actually... This is a weird thing that happens in the sec in this book and also the third book where Percy is having like nightmares, like dreams about what is going on. Like in this book, he's having literal communications with Grover through his dreams. Like they're literally having a conversation and um, going back and forth, like giving information in his dreams. And in the next book, he has nightmares about Annabeth being tortured by Luke and and all that kind of stuff. And the only reason why they know what she's going through is because of what he sees when he's having dreams about his best friend being tortured. Yet in both of these books, they don't want him to go on the quest. And it's like, do you understand how stupid that is? <laughs> that like you're asking, you're sending people on a quest to go look for someone. The person that has like a literal brain connection with the other person that's going, you want them to stay at camp where nobody can, where if he has dreams about what's going on, he can't tell them mm -hmm. because none of them can have technology or anything because they're they're demigod kids. They can't have phones, even yeah. if you want to pretend like they're doing this in the real time now, like on the show. And I'm like, so how does that make any sense at all? And the the part when one of the Aries kids is like, you just want to go because you want to be in like spotlight. And it's like, do you think that that made sense? <laughs> like you, like he just he just told you that one of his best friends is being stalked by a cyclops, and that they need to get the golden fleece back. And the golden fleece is where he is, not by because he was trying to find it, but pure like accident, basically, that he ended up finding it. And he's having dreams communicating with him in his mind. And you think he wants to go just for like the glory? <laughs> Like, I'm pretty sure he wants to go because his best friend's in danger and he keeps having dreams about it. So why not go? <laughs> Just... Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Like the modes of communication are what Iris message. Mm -hmm. um, like that's literally the only communication we've seen them use. So yep. that's the only one they really have. And I said that before, but that's just what I like about these books is that the kids at camp are doing stupid things. They're not like they're not making sense. They're getting like wrapped up. That's kind of Percy's whole thing um, that kind of follows him throughout all of these, especially in Heroes of Olympus. My God, those books are crazy because of stuff like this. But like those books, it gets more intense, but it's purely like the thing of people don't understand him because they're like putting their projections of who they think he is onto him. Like he doesn't want to go on these quests. Um, he was, he literally had to be like blackmailed into going on the first one. I'm really mad about how it happened in this, in these chapters with Hermes that we will talk about whenever we want to talk about that. But, yeah. um, but either way, like, it's not like he wants to, it's not like he like woke up one day and was like, I hope that one of my best friends is in mortal danger. <laughs> of course. And, so. that, and like, I hope that I keep having dreams about this stuff so that I like, can't stop thinking about it and thinking sitting there at camp watching everything die slowly and everyone being attacked and not knowing what to do like obviously that's not what he wants like what the heck and like yeah he has to go on all these quests but they're it reminds me of like i said with harry potter like ron being the absolute fucking worst friend in the entire world like at least in this situation it's not percy's best friend that is saying these comments it's a random aries kid that just doesn't want to like him because he kicked his dad's ass in a fight <laughs> and so at least there's that that even though they're treating him this way annabeth isn't the one being like you just want to go because you want oh my god <laughs> like they would not be friends anymore if she talked to him that way yeah and it's, that's it's the correct the response <laughs> it is the leo experience i'm telling you this idea that leos want the spotlight no we don't no we don't like it follows us it's and it's it's also like a neurodivergent experience like and when i say neurodivergency i think most people think 
neurodivergency only means ADHD and autism and like it does but also there's other neurodivergencies including like dyslexia and complex PTSD regular P PTSD all kinds of things in that general umbrella and Percy has like three of those things <laughs> that we know of like PTSD ADHD and dyslexia and so it's very common for people who fall into that group for people to just kind of look at us differently or like misunderstand what we're doing because that was a that was a theme for me too like the way that it, that showed up for me is that a lot of kids when i was in like middle school and high school especially like maybe this happened before and they just didn't tell me but at least during those years people sometimes would tell me that they thought that the reason why I was quiet and I didn't talk to anybody was because I thought that I was better than everybody. And it was actually the complete and total reverse. And like when they would, like I can vividly remember in seventh grade, somebody saying that to me in Spanish class and just looking at them and being like, I don't talk to you because I don't think you would like me. And they just like looked at me like what? And I was like, what and i just like ignored them for like the rest of the like the rest of the year because i was just like that is so different from how i feel that i genuinely don't even know how to respond <laughs> to something like that and but that like that's very much this situation like there is there's nothing that could be more far away from percy than to think that he's someone who just wants like attention mm -hmm. and glory or Cleos or any any attention at all like it's probably his best like i think it's funny that his dream for adulthood is to just go to new rome and be a normal person that's all he wants to do like i just want to live somewhere where i won't have to die anymore or be in danger of dying and that annabeth won't die and that we can just like have normal jobs and do normal things and be a normal marine biologist and she can be a normal like architecture person and we can have kids that might end up not being normal. And so like that's literally his entire dream is to just be a normal person because he's never been a normal person. And so like that's yeah, that very much fits with people that fall into that like general neurodivergency. My life is crazy sort of spectrum is people misunderstand us. And it's just it's almost fascinating to find out what people think about us like who do you think i really am i don't even know what to say <laughs> it's always very wrong but it's it's kind of fascinating to me how people get there like how did you how did you how would you ever think that i think anything good about myself what have i done wrong to make you think that i like myself <laughs> percy would also say that so <laughs> i can see that <laughs> i do want to jump back to the chariot race though because filming that is going to be probably a nightmare. It's I mean, wild. technology is better. Um, but it comes to mind, how many adults do you remember talking about somebody dying on the set of Ben-Hur? Like, yeah. I, and I don't know the full details myself, but like, even just filming chariot races is dangerous. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and there's, and this isn't the only one. There's another one yeah. at like the end of the book when they come back from the quest and everything. Um, the kids did a bunch of training before they started season one for like sword fighting and things like that. One of those cute behind the scenes stories I thought uh, that was, it was like funny. And also I was like, can I learn how to do this somehow? No, I can't. But it was that they would play sword ping pong, that they would play ping pong with their swords at like the end of the day to like for something, basically like you made it through the day. So here's something fun for you guys to do. Um, and so, I'm imagining that the kids that would be in the chariot race would have to go through like a lot of training purely just to know like how is this even going to work like how is this going to happen because they would never and they would never do something in this production that even like got close to like the kids actually being in a dangerous situation yeah um, they'll probably get a green screen a lot of it maybe yeah. like cgi especially well they're gonna have to cgi clarice's yeah, like, I, like just like tool. like small behind the scenes stuff like just to if anyone's ever worried about that kind of thing like when they filmed the tunnel of love scenes where they weren't in the water like the scenes when percy and annabeth are arguing and he goes into the chair and stuff there was like four or five like divers in the water and the, just in case one of them fell in the water 
-hmm. And so, like, there's, like, there was nine people with Walker when he was underwater filming scenes underwater. Like, they, there's, like, an abundance, and some of that, I'm sure, is, like, legal things they're supposed to do. But you can also tell when sets actually care and they're like being overly cautious about their about their kid actors and so i'm like i was picturing that in my head of like i wonder how they're gonna film something like that without it's just too easy for an accident like that to happen but at the same time that was that's a very complicated it's just it's complicated because they're, the birds aren't going to be real mm -hmm. and so like they could put in some real birds to mix in with like CGI birds or something that they would have to add in, but at least some of it won't be actually happening. And I was just trying to picture in my head, like, what would that even look like on screen? Like I have never watched the Sea of Monsters movie and I won't do it unless somebody gives me money. But um, it made me wonder if they did it in that movie at all. I watched enough of it to see what they did to Tyson and was like, eh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about this. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know how they'll film it. So the the Jason and the Argonauts film he referenced, I don't think I ever had to watch that. Jason and the Argonauts, along with Hercules, are actually, mm -hmm. like, two hero storylines that I did not study in classics, like, surprisingly somehow. So I know the basic plot of them, but I don't know that much. I do know CG and Birds was Hercules, and it was exactly how they scared off the birds, you know, loud noise, and the birds flew up and then he was able to shoot them with a bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a relatively easy monster to defeat, but it's more the sheer volume of them. And yeah, like, are they gonna film with mixed real birds and then CGI some in? Um, they're probably definitely gonna have to CGI in the ones that are attacking because I doubt they're going to train birds to attack children. <laughs> no, and like, and they did have, they had pigeons in the first episode of season one when they were filming in new york city mm -hmm. the only reason i know that is because walker scobell mentioned in an interview that he's afraid of pigeons and was like afraid that if he laid on the floor like he has to during that scene with all the pigeons around him that they would try to eat him oh my gosh and i was like okay well now they're actually going to try to eat you <laughs> yeah. and he's and <laughs> so there's that that's the only reason why i know that so they did work with like animal people before that they could just call those people in again but yeah i i can imagine i can like picture in my head behind the scenes things i've seen with like other productions where they would like hook up like the chariot things on uh, to like a like a rolling thing on the ground where mm -hmm. but there's still always the chance that something would go wrong and it would like flop over or something but i also want to believe that that disney especially considering considering the absolutely bonkers factoid that this tv show has 23 percent of all viewership on disney plus for this year and three of the episodes came out in 2023 like that's absolutely bonkers how many people have watched this show and so if they're going to come out with technology like that like <laughs> disney's going to give it to this show considering how it's the most like well like liked show they've done in many years like it's even doing better than the star wars and like i i see that one video i stitched was so funny because it was a dude bitching that like nobody likes marvel shows anymore nobody's watching them and i'm like i don't care about that because everyone's watching percy jackson and traumatized children <laughs> like that's that's the priorities i have right now i don't care that nobody likes marvel things right now that's because people are sick of Marvel. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I, I'm sure that they'll figure it out. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Were, in my mind, I like could not picture how it was going to happen. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if they show us any of that stuff or if Rick talks about it at all. Because he does like doing, he does like weekly updates <laughs> when they're filming. Like I remember seeing those when they were filming season one. He never says anything too specific, but he just will kind of, show like kind of the the episode they're filming and maybe a little bit of where they're filming or something to give people a little bit of an idea of what they're doing and so we'll see if we get anything like that now now that everyone knows when the show is supposed to start filming everyone is like extremely dying to know who's going to play tyson <laughs> yes. 
it's just Dyson. Like, there's other characters that could be in it. Like, um, actually, one thing about these chapters that made me happy and also sad, which is, I feel like, a very Percy Jackson thing, is um, Beckendorf, Charlie Beckendorf, okay. being in these chapters and being the only other kid at camp besides Percy that's really nice to Tyson because he's been around Cyclops before. And is like helping, like gives him like literal stim toys to play with, basically. Um, in in like this, I, and it's sad. I I love Beckendorf so much, and that makes me so depressed <laughs> thinking about what happens to him. Oh, He's, don't I don't I don't remember, so don't spoil it. But yeah, I won't, but don't don't ever search his name on on TikTok because he makes everybody really sad. Um, because everybody loves him so. <laughs> And but um yes I love and that I loved seeing him as like and he's actually one of the rare characters that I can remember in this series that is like that um Rick made black like from the beginning like when he is described in this chapter I'm pretty sure I can't remember if he was described in this chapter or in he's probably described in the first book but it just like describes him as being African American, and so I hope that um, I hope that he gets like his casting gets announced too, even though he doesn't have that much of a role in this season. But he is there, and he is like like I said, the only other person besides Percy that is nice to that's nice to Tyson, and that's that sh that kind of thing should be rewarded by, by being on screen when you're nice to the autistic child and gives him stim boys to play with. I feel like they're gonna have to, because to develop Tyson's character, he needs to go through that arc of learning how to be in the forge and make things, and um, that's a big part of his journey as well, so I think they'll have to. Yeah, I think so. Um, I hope so because I want to. I want to see him just because, and everyone wants to see him, because yeah. we all love him so much. <laughs> so there's that. And uh, what else could I say besides just yelling about Hermes? Um, oh, uh, we have the empathy link, and I know we talked about it before. Yeah. But um, one thing that I do think is interesting is that, like, I feel like Grover even doing the empathy link knowing how much is at stake linking himself to percy that way just shows how much he believes in him mm -hmm. i thought one of the comments that annabeth says when they're having that discussion about that and like it was interesting to read um annabeth not believe him mm -hmm. that like his dream was real and that grover was really in a place that had like the thing they needed to help fix camp and it was interesting, it was just like, it threw me off, like reading her be like, I don't know if you could do that, that would be really hard to do. And it's like, have you met Grover and Percy? <laughs> like they're best friends. Of course, Grover found a way to connect to him. It was really cool to read Percy just being in the dream, being like almost like trying to wake himself up to like move in the actual dream of like, does it talk to Grover already? He's like trying to help you. Um, and, but, I that was really cool to see them connect to that level to the point that well that's why people talk about that empathy link in later books because um because Grover would literally feel it if Percy died or was close to death and yeah. there's many times that he is close to death and he would definitely have felt it and so it it does show how much he trusts him which we would which i mean after the first season of the show how could he not like that's not even going to be hard to believe that that grover would trust percy enough and that percy would trust him enough to connect like be okay with being connected to him in a way where if something happened to grover that he would die too i feel like their friendship was really shown so well in the show that makes that sort of connection make more sense than it did when i read the books for the first time but i just love it that they are connected that well that they could do something like that and that grover could get his attention enough to be like i need you to figure out where i am mm -hmm. and it yeah and i i like the whole thing too that the sea of monsters like moves depending on where like the western world is seen as being that mm -hmm. now it's in like the caribbean yeah it's the Bermuda triangle which like 
I don't even know why we have this weird like um energy around the topic of the Bermuda Triangle. Like has anything actually ever happened there? I've never looked at <laughs> one up. So one millennial thing that I think is really funny is how when we were young, like especially like my age of millennial, um when I was little, people were obsessed with the Bermuda Triangle for some reason. I don't know why there was like all of these things that were like be aware of the Bermuda Triangle. It was like a plot in like every cartoon I ever watched. And I and I remember re on like TikTok somewhere people made someone made a video being like, why were they so worried about the Bermuda Triangle? Like nothing ever ha like we never nothing that never went anywhere. But why were they so focused on that? It's kind of like how they told us about the the hole in the ozone layer and that that got fixed, but they never came back and told us that that got fixed. And so it, it's like, it feels like that of like, why were they so obsessed with scaring all of us about this one section of the sea that they, I don't know why they talked about it so much, but it, but it, they talked about it that much that I remember when I read these books for the first time, I was like, oh, that's totally where it is because I watched like five different movies that were about the freaking Bermuda Triangle before I was 10. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So <laughs> That's been an urban legend and like there's a, a, a meme or I can't remember if it was originally a tweet. I just remember the words of like, I always thought I'd have to worry more about quicksand than I did. <laughs> That's another millennial experience. For some reason, I thought I would have <laughs> come across quicksand by now. <laughs> yeah, it's like, why were we also, why was like every, what was going on with like cartoons in the 90s where they were obsessed with the Reunion Triangle and falling into quicksand when there is no quicksand in the United States. And most of them were made by American companies. <laughs> I don't know why that was such like a weird fear for all of us that we, instead of the things that we should have actually been worried about. <laughs> One thing with these chapters that I just think is, that I think will be really good to watch like on the show is how things at camp are so messed up that Percy is sitting there for a couple days knowing that Grover is in danger and he can't do anything about it. And that his other best friend, Annabeth, is doesn't even believe him when he's trying to tell her what's going on. And so it's like, if Annabeth won't believe him, then like, how is he gonna convince anyone else to listen to him? And it, it takes like a while for her to believe that this is even happening. And it's like, this is Grover. <laughs> like, this is Grover we're talking about here. Can we like get our stuff together and figure this out? so that we can save him before he dies because I really don't want to have a dream of my best friend dying. And, but it is like, it shows just kind of how backwards or I don't even know, like everything with camp has been that Percy like legitimately has not had a chance to tell someone that Grover who has helped a lot of people at camp is in danger and somebody needs to go save him. And he has to manipulate like somebody just to get them to have somebody go after him and then they pick like the worst person to go after him. <laughs> they put they pick like the person that um wouldn't care as much and doesn't have and isn't getting information from him and it's like they obviously don't actually like tantalus doesn't actually care like what is going to happen to grover and it's just wild like this is supposed to be the good people and he's having to like emotionally manipulate multiple people before he can get someone to believe him that his best friend is in danger and they need to go help him before a cyclops eats him yeah it's just shouldn't this be more important than it is well the only reason i think annabeth doesn't believe him is because it, he tells her while they're still arguing yes and, yeah i i think I was frustrated for Percy in that moment of like you should know him well enough to know he's not gonna lie about shit like this but um I don't know Annabeth just gets too caught up sometimes and um so when she finally comes around it's like okay thank thank you like yes <laughs> and but and when she goes to the campfire to um try to manipulate Tantalus into it I love the progression of that scene. That that progression is going to be great to watch on film because like they literally have the fire in the background that's like changing color as people are getting more excited about, oh, a quest that can save the camp, somebody needs to do this. Mm -hmm. And the different flare-ups of emotion of, you know, Percy getting called out of like, you just want to go on another quest, bro. And like, 
you know, the people that probably, there probably are people that genuinely believe him. It's just, they're mm -hmm. not the loud ones, you know? Yeah, they're not Aries kids that are getting all the attention because he wants to give, because Clarice got the quest instead of him. Um, one thing with that too that I thought was intriguing was hierarchy of how things work. In the first book, in The Lightning Thief, when they get back from like Olympus and all that, they're at camp for the next like two months. And then two months later is when Luke takes him out into the forest and tries to kill him. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why Percy in that version doesn't have time to think about what's going on in the underworld they don't like process anything at all he he like literally does not he's like doing the ptsd i'm just going to avoid this until i don't have to anymore thing and so they they just it doesn't click for him and then after he's at camp for months it's just kind of it that's why luke is able to surprise him the way that he is and a friend of mine brought this up that it is an interesting dynamic that it might be easier for Percy for people to believe him in the show because in the show Annabeth was there. And so in the books, it's kind of like the new kid that just got here that just went on this huge quest and saved everybody. That's a, a big three kid is now saying that everyone's like best friend is evil. And so they don't want to believe him because he's the he's like new and he's different and he gets to do things that nobody else has done and all that kind of stuff. And, and it comes up with that whole discussion where he is talking about the dream that he has and then Annabeth has to take over and talk for him. And when she's talking, he says that like people start believing her and like taking it seriously when she is talking because she's someone who's trusted, who's been at camp for a long time and they just won't believe him in the same way. And it's just one of those like hierarchy things of camp that even though it's his dream, he just knows that they're not going to believe him. They're not going to listen to him the same way that they would listen to Annabeth. Yeah. And it is true. And I like hope that it goes the same way when they're talking about if they show this scene like in the show. Because that is true, that people at camp listen to Annabeth more than they would listen to him. And it's just one of those things of he knows how to use what he needs to use to try to get what he wants, even though it backfires in his face. I think with Clarice, what um, what I would love to see is I feel like even though it's really subtle, I feel like she's already sort of like shaky in, in this responsibility because she only won the chariot race by chance. I think she knows that deep down, even though there is that pride that she feels of having the victory. Um, <laughs> because like literally she wouldn't have won had she not had that net and her horses had actual flesh you know like mm -hmm. the only reason her horses didn't stop is because they weren't getting pecked to death like everybody else mm -hmm. and um so when she gets chosen for the quest i want to see some hesitation i want to see some like you know i'm not quite sure about this but i know i'm supposed to say yes and i know i'm supposed to be happy about this on her face and i feel like dior is going to do it well yeah because she is like in even the, so the chapter of this, like she, it says she looks like really surprised mm -hmm. that she's given the quest and she doesn't really get excited about doing it and accept it until her siblings are like basically like yelling at Percy about him wanting to go. And so then she's like, okay, but that is like her story in this book that I, from what I remember is someone who's very much like way over her head and doesn't want to admit it because she feels like that would be admitting weakness and that would be bad but she has no idea like what she's doing when she goes on this quest like she's not not ready to do something like that and yeah that makes sense because the quest isn't actually for her like mm -hmm. she's being forced to do it but it's not a quest that she would have otherwise done because um, it's really not fair to ask her to do all of this stuff and go out there when Luke is out there and find and go to like the sea of monsters and find Grover when she doesn't have a connection to him and won't be able to like, you know, communicate with him in any way to figure out where he is. And she's also never been on a quest before. And so this is a pretty, like every quest is big, but your first quest being like, go out and save camp. And if you don't get the golden fleece back in time, everyone will be dead by the time you get back. Yeah, that's pretty big responsibility. That's a that's a huge responsibility when somebody is giving you that quest purely out of spite. Mm 
-hmm. Like, it's not even because you would actually be the best person for it. It's literally just because he's an, he's being a jerk. Yeah. That's not fair to, to put on her either. to Percy having to make a really crazy decision of am I going to go out anyway knowing this is against the rules um I mean Tantalus threatened them with the harpies and mm -hmm. said you know like the harpies will peck you to death if you guys try to sneak out of camp and of course while he's thinking of this himself he then gets manipulated by his uncle <laughs> by uncle Hermes who um says something that triggers every single one of us estranged adult children, um, as the fire bomb puts it. God, I'm like so interested to see how I feel reading these books again, because when I read these books a lot, like I read these books many, many times for many, many years, all of those years that I read them, I had not been in therapy yet. And the thing that Hermes said I would have agreed with at the time. And now it makes me want to stab him in the throat. <laughs> besides other things that he does during that scene that's like kind of uh that like that's like the cherry on top of why i'm mad at him but just horrible for him to say something like that of, oh you can never you can never get upset at your family ever and never have any bad opinions towards them even if they try to murder you still no and it's like that's easy for you to say sir because that's your son and you're a chicken you're a baby chicken yeah. and will not go and confront your own child and instead are sending a seventh grader to do it instead yeah. well and he's yeah. the manipulator he's the master manipulator of the gods so he has never had to deal with consequences so the story they allude to this will be my one mythology story for this one is the story of when he was a newborn and he stole apollo's cattle they like very briefly allude to it, but it shows how manipulative he actually is because at one day old, he sneaks out of his cradle, he goes and grabs cattle that's Apollo's, he skins and cooks two of them on his own. And while he's out having this little adventure, he happens to create the liar, which is the only thing that saves him because once Apollo confronts him and he's like, I'm just a baby, it wasn't me. But Zeus is like, I don't buy it, kid. Where are the cattle? Um, he Apollo sees the liar and is like, Oh, what is that thing? Okay, never mind, you're cool, kid. And um, like I believe there's also a he creates some sort of shepherd's pipe as well. And Apollo's just like, Okay, yeah, you're cool. And um Apollo's like, you know, from now on, you're we're family, I love you, it's cool. Um, so he has never been held accountable to my knowledge in greek mythology in the way some other gods may have been or may have had to at least confront how they have been he's just manipulative from the start he's the trickster god he is the the god of thieves you know like people like to focus on the messenger part because it's the cooler part it's the um more practical part but He's got that manipulation in him that surely has passed on to Luke. Well, and that's the thing about, first off, the autism was happening because when he was telling that story, I generally did not know what he was talking about. Like, I did not pick up at all that he was talking about himself. Like, when I read that the first time and this time, I was like, why is he talking about that? Like, I generally had no idea what he was trying to say. So that's fun. But also... um, that's one of the things when I was reading this, I was like, why does everyone at camp and the world have such a hard time believing that Luke is evil and is like not coming back and that you can't save him when this is his dad was able to manipulate somebody when he was a baby. Imagine how manipulative somebody would be with that person as your dad if you don't care about morals and only care about getting what you want. Like, no wonder why by this point in this book, Luke is already manipulating Selena into being his little mole when she's a 13 year old girl. Like the girl who teaches Percy how to ride a Pegasus is the one that's being his mole. And she's already being forced to do that. He messes with Annabeth for many, many books. He messes with so many other kids in so many other ways that I can't even think of right now. And it's like a frustrating thing to read his dad being so manipulative like and 
also being very manipulative in how he basically forces Percy to go on this quest. Like, he doesn't actually have a choice. Mm -hmm. And, like, he doesn't have any choice at all. Like, in the first book, at least, they have to literally convince him to go because he doesn't want to go. But they have to get him to want to go. Like, he has to actually, like, say yes. They can't force him to go on this quest if he doesn't want to do it he basically there's no way that he can say no like he's like hey i'm gonna show up at camp when you're by yourself at night i'm gonna make your friends believe that you're in danger so they come running towards you i'm gonna give you like go away bags and the boat that you're supposed to leave on is like is like on like long island sound right now and if it passes by without you getting on it then you can't go on this quest and you can't save your friend and you can't save camp and he's telling per like Percy. He's telling Hermes, I don't want to go. He's literally saying the words, no, I don't want to go. I don't think this is a good idea. And Hermes is like, too bad. Bye. Like you have to go anyway. And it's not because he actually cares about camp. He doesn't give a fuck about camp. He doesn't care about Percy at all. He only cares about Luke. He wants Percy to go so he can save Luke. This is the only, he doesn't care at all about what happens to Percy. He could not care like less honestly, what happens to Percy or anyone else. And knowing what happens to Percy when he interacts with Luke in this book, it's fucking horrible to think about how his dad basically forced him into that position. Is one of the gods that is like kind of nice to him sometimes, but he just doesn't care about him at all. And it's just horrible to read him being like that of prioritizing Luke over everyone else. And it's like, the only reason you care this much about Luke is because he makes you look bad. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the only reason I can ever think of, because you didn't care about him when he was actually not evil. Not really. Like, he um, stayed away from him because Luke hates him. <laughs> so, an abusive, neglectful parent caring about you when you don't want to talk to them ever again. But all the years when you were there and wanted them to come around, they're just, they're not there. But it just was horrible to read that whole interaction of Hermes being like, hey, I'm the cool god. Like, you should listen to me, bro. Like, be my friend and go save my son. But doing it in a way where he just doesn't have the option. I hate whenever they don't give him the option to say no, because it's not fair. Like, the the quest that they're going on is dangerous. He should get, he should be able to at least decide if he actually wants to do it or not. Instead of feeling like if he doesn't go right now, then he has, he has like no choice. Like in the next, the little bit of the next chapter that I read, like he asked, he asked Tyson, like, do you want to go? And Tyson's, he says like, Tyson can come with us if he wants to come. And Tyson immediately is like, yes, I want to come. Yeah. Um, but still like, that's how it should work. Like you should ask people, do you want to go on a quest where you might die before you're being forced to go on it? Well, and the and thing is, if, if Hermes wanted to manipulate the right way, I mean, I know I just said he's a master manipulator. He could have just said, hey, here's what you need to save Grover. And it would have worked. Percy would have ran off. You know, like Percy would have done it all on his own and made it on the ship on time without him even threatening. Like, hey, if you don't do this in five minutes, the harpies are going to come. Um, you know, so um, there was a way to do it right but it, it underscores the whole luke being the golden child thing that even though there was this opportunity to be like hey let's save grover he still went with the luke angle it's that whole thing that manip manipulative people like that they can't they almost like can't help telling you what they want you to do and especially if they think that their manipulation is working on you, they like get excited about thinking that it's worked. And so then they like, then they give away why they're actually doing it. And they kind of generally believe that the person they're doing it to like won't pick up on it, like won't realize what they're doing. And like, funny enough, this is like a trait with Hermes people with Hermes and Luke doing that. Like Luke at the end of the, in the finale of the show, doesn't realize that Percy and Annabeth know what he's done until Percy literally tells him to his face because it just he just thinks that he's manipulative manipulated both of them enough where they won't figure it out and until they say it out he says it out loud it just it just doesn't occur to him that they would have figured out what he was doing in the same way that Hermes here I don't think he thinks that he did anything wrong there by 
telling Percy, like, no, you should go and also make sure to also help Luke. And him trying to say, like, I don't think there's any saving Luke. I, he's, I don't think that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. And him just saying, no, just do it anyway. And being like, you can't give up on family. And it's like, Luke is not his family necessarily. Like, he is, but he's not. It's definitely not his responsibility. Like, number one, it's not Percy's responsibility to go save the person that just tried to kill him. Yeah. It's actually everyone else's responsibility except for him. Because he's the one that was horribly traumatized by that. Either way, the show or the or the book, they're both very traumatic things for him to go through. And so usually, just generally, this is me being a sarcastic asshole, but generally... To me, if somebody is horribly traumatized by another person, they shouldn't be the one in charge of helping that person. Mm -hmm. Because they shouldn't have to help them ever. Everyone else can help them. Everyone else who wasn't almost killed by them, they can do it. But they shouldn't have to do that because that makes you feel, that makes you, that's so hard then to feel like you're not allowed to be mad at them because everyone is telling you like oh no you should go and help them and forgive them because they were a good person before the scene in this in these chapters when he is able to just like be angry at luke is when he's alone because he can't be like that when he's around anyone else yeah because everyone else is constantly telling him no don't be mad at luke don't think that he's bad don't don't like bring this up don't be don't have the like the and it's just the most scapegoat thing that can possibly ever happen that percy has to sit there by himself at night watching over the camp watching like the nature just die while it's being poisoned by luke and he can't even like it's just this like wild thing that like the reason why you're asking me to go on this quest is because your son is poisoning this camp Mm -hmm. and puts literally every single person in this camp in danger like every single kid at this camp is being attacked right now and is in danger and you're manipulating me to go out on this quest to save them all and i wouldn't have to do this right now if your son didn't do this first and you're still telling me that i should prioritize i should prioritize luke and his well-being over my own like luke is an adult like that's also part of this that makes me really mad is like luke is 20 years old he's a he's an adult Mm-hmm. He's a full ass, like grown adult. He's, you know, he's like 20 year olds are still babies, but they're very much more older than a 13 year old yeah. that just finished seventh grade. And so, how is it that the 13 year old is responsible for saving a 20 year old who is just trying to kill everybody? Like, how is this working that, that out of everybody that could go and help save Luke, that it's Percy? Like, he is the worst. That is the worst person that you could do this with. Like, pick one of the kids in Hermes. Like, pick Chris Rodriguez. Why not have, why not claim Chris Rodriguez and his, Luke's actual, like, not only brother, but best friend when he was at camp and get him to go talk to Luke. Like, that would be way more successful than to bring the kid that the last, like, like Percy says in these chapters, the last thing that Luke said to him is that the golden age is coming and you're not going to be a part of it. Yes. I would say my first read of this, I was distracted by the Caducas. I was I was uh, yeah. very distracted by George and Martha, which like, I, like I have them. a feeling that that could happen on screen very, very well. Like, because um, Lin-Manuel Miranda with the little snakes, if they decide to portray it that way, is definitely going to be an attention stealer of the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think it, it probably underscores Rick's point that like you can't you can't judge people on whether or not they're a monster based off of how they look because mm-hmm. um, you know like the George and Martha thing is funny but he like you said he's literally asking him go go and help the person who just tried to kill you. They think that Tyson is bad because he's related to Cyclops and some Cyclops can go after kids and so they think that he's bad purely because of who he's related to they think that chiron is bad purely because of who he is related to that his dad is chronos but chiron was the one that said like i don't want you to i don't even want you to be at camp i don't but if you are at camp please never leave camp 
because I'm afraid that Luke is going to kill you. Well, Hermes is seen as like the nice, happy guy. His son is out there murdering people and trying to destroy the world. And he's being told, he's trying to convince a, a couple, like 13 year olds to go out and risk their life for his son's benefit. Hermes seems like the happy, nice, like fun God that people like to be around generally. But throughout the course of these books, he puts Luke first over everybody. Like the fact that Luke ends up in Elysium is the most stupid ass joke I've ever heard in my life. I know it's that system of reward and punishment in the afterlife is not dependent on how good of a person you were, unfortunately. And, and so and it actually like, does check out. <laughs> like many months from now, we'll get to like those books, but that's like, I could do like an entire, like no script, like three hour long rant about the idea that if you are an absolute monster of a person your entire life, that if you do one nice thing at the end of your life, that you should just that because you did that one nice thing, that that means that you're somehow a good person and people feel like you need, they need to defend you and that you should be given all of these rewards. And it's like, no, that's actually less than the bare minimum to do one nice thing. Yeah. After doing like you shouldn't you shouldn't need to be pushed to the limit in order to stop killing people and to just kill yourself instead. And this is like uh, I don't know. This is like a whole weird thing with like villains lately ever. I, someone on one of my Harry Potter videos commented that they called it the Snape effect, and I'm like, that's probably what it is, that Snape was a horrible, manipulative, abusive little monster, horribly abusing and bullying a child because he looked like his dad when he had no control over that at all, and didn't even know what his dad even did to him. And also, his dad didn't do that bad to him because you were a fascist and called his girlfriend a racial slur so like what do you what do you want <laughs> what do you want from harry potter at this point like you are definitely in the wrong there my dude but either way like he's horrible in the last book at the last second you find out this like weird story with lily that is put in a light where you're supposed to think it's romantic even though it's creepy as fuck is actually a good guy and it's like why does people why do people keep doing this with villains like it's like do you like the bar is like do I have to be a monster my entire life to get people to like me? Because that's what it feels like, that like people will fall over themselves still to try to come up with excuses for Luke. It's like, what about everyone else but him? Like, what about literally everyone else but him? Like, why don't they get this stuff? Like, why does, like, this is skipping way forward, but I'm not going to say who it is, but why does some of his like the victims of him that were victimized the most by him that die like right before he dies. Can you like, I can't even imagine them being in like the afterlife and Elysium being together and being happy, being at peace after everything that happened to them that he put them through for years. And then he shows up there and gets to be there with them. Like that is the most golden child thing you can possibly ever imagine that because his dad is Hermes, and his dad has been running around the magical world trying to like basically be a flying monkey for Luke, that when he does the bare minimum, which is when he realizes that he has lost, that he kills himself so that Percy ha doesn't have to kill him, because that would be very, that would be very bad if Percy had to, because that's what Percy thought he was going to have to do. And that's what would have happened if Luke didn't, did it, didn't do it. Like the idea that because he killed himself instead of making Percy kill him, that he's rewarded for that and like called a hero and all of this stuff. And it's like, what is Percy? And what is everyone else who he put all of this stuff through if Luke is a hero? Like, I don't even know what to, like, that's just so messed up. And so it just makes me mad seeing like how this pattern is already starting with him that I was not aware of at all when I first read these books because I was in extreme denial about every facet of my life. <laughs> so I didn't, I just didn't see this. I didn't know this stuff when I first read these books. And it's just so frustrating to know how hard all of this stuff is going to be for all of them. And that knowing that if they keep things going like the show versus the book which they're going to they're not going to change anything that big it's a huge part of all of their characters um that it's just going to be that happening consistently of people prioritizing luke 
maybe this is cynical for people that don't have like a background of like child abuse or the level of child abuse that I experienced, but it is, it is like accurate to life mm -hmm. that people prioritize the comfortability of the, of the abuser over the victim. Even when Annabeth is arguing with Percy in this book and other books about Luke and stuff, she's also a victim of, of all of this. It like, makes me think of like Shia LaBeouf. I, I saw oh, something God, yes. that like someone said he's having a bit of a comeback moment and like people are turning back on his side. And so I saw a post someone had made of like, just a reminder, this is what Shia LaBeouf did. This is why we were all mad at him. You guys can't change your mind now. Um, like that's what that makes me think of. Um, because this idea that you could do something so horrible, but come back from it. Like that's one of the problems I've always had with Christianity where it's like, oh yeah. So if on my deathbed, I pray to Jesus, I go to heaven. Like, fuck that, fuck that. <laughs> Well, and it's just the thing, I guess the stuff with like Shia LaBeouf and stuff shows that, and a million other famous people, like it honestly kind of haunts me to think that if Harvey Weinstein wasn't found guilty for another rape in California, he would be out of prison right now. Like he raped too many women, that too many women had the same story. Like that was the reason why they got rid of that other conviction in New York, which is what? Like, don't call this the justice system anymore if that's the kind of stuff you're going to do with it. Just why FYI. His technique, if it kept working, like I yeah. hate to put it that way, but like if he had a technique that was working, he's not going to change it up. <laughs> well, yeah. And also, I don't know if people know this, but when you're a predator, you generally do the same thing every time because it works every time. Like as long as it works, you're gonna keep doing the same thing. It's only if it doesn't work or the victims you have start like fighting against it or you don't get away with it, that people will start to change things because why would they change things if everything is going the way that they want it to? Like, like duh. This is like an established fact in true crime. So I don't even know why people like us feel like we need to say this stuff because it's it should be obvious. But like, I guess what I'm trying to say with that is that even the most well-known people from like the Me Too whatever time, most of them have had moments where they've gotten their careers back in some way. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it reminds, it weirdly reminds me of seeing younger people who like Percy Jackson that I'll see posts sometimes of ones where they'll say like, oh, Luke had a point. Or there was a whole trend going around being like, oh, Luke realized at the very end that he made a mistake and he did the right thing. And TikTok literally put me in like TikTok jail, like would not let, first they took the captions off of the video. Mm -hmm. And then when I tried to re-upload it, they just like said it wasn't able to be on the For You page. So literally one person saw it when it was up for like an hour and a half. So I just deleted it and I was like, fine, I guess I'm not allowed to talk about this. But it's like, he never did that. He never did that. He never realized that he that he made a mistake and did the right thing. You are giving him so much credit in the way that people do with actual real life abusers. Like Shia LaBeouf did not realize that he made a mistake and like realize that he did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Like just like Diddy didn't realize that he did anything wrong either. People like that don't do that. They don't think that what they're doing is wrong. They just don't want to be caught because they don't want people to be mad at them. Like yeah the fact that diddy's whole thing was like i'm sorry that you guys saw that i'm like why are you apologizing to us we don't know you like yeah we're like, apologize man. to your ex <laughs> he never apologizes to her he never mentions her at all he doesn't mm -hmm. apologize about doing what he did he apologizes about us having to see it because that's all he that's all people like that care about they care about that they were caught and if you want to like compare that to like percy jackson stuff because all of this stuff is very much um, Rick Riordan te trying to teach kids about like abuse dynamics and things like that through like these stories. That's very much what he's doing. That's an obvious thing to say is that like even the even if he is called a hero, and even if like the prophecy says he's a hero, and even if his dad is like desperate for people to see him as a hero, and literally tells Percy over and over again that you're not allowed to be mad at him and he ends up in like the highest form but it's just that's like the best parallel you can get of like he never realized what he did was wrong he just realized that he lost and killed himself so that nobody else would like 
the thing I said in that video that I wish I could have said was it's the audacity of Luke in that scene at the very end, like the last Olympian to tell Percy, like, don't forget about kids like me and kids like Ethan. You don't know who Ethan is, but that's fine. Um, like kids who don't have a place at camp, like, don't forget about us. And I'm like, I will stab you because Percy has never forgotten about those people. You forgot about them. You did. Like, in this book, Percy is going out there on a quest, even though he knows that it's very dangerous if he runs into Luke again. And he runs into him multiple times, and he tries to kill him multiple times in horrible ways. He's going out on a very dangerous quest that he doesn't even want to leave and, like, actually necessarily do. But he's forced to do it to save everybody at camp because you are trying to kill them. Like, he has to go out again in the third book because you kidnapped Annabeth and you are torturing her. Like he is having to, do, he's doing all of this stuff in all of these books to try to help those kids. I can't even imagine like him saying that to Percy with a straight face of saying like, oh, don't forget about all these kids and make sure that like the gods actually know what happened. It's like, you do realize that he's been doing this this entire fucking time. Well, you've been trying to kill them all, like literally kill all of them. And so it's like, what? Stop acting like you care. Like, you don't, like, it's a, the, a weird thing that they all do where they try to act like they care. And it's like, just be honest, my dudes. <laughs> just, yeah. just say that you don't care because that would be better than pretending like you give a shit. These situations that Luke presents happen in real life. Like, real life teenage kids deal with people like Luke who take advantage of their age, them trusting them, the fact that they're conventionally attractive, mm -hmm. the fact that they know something about them and can use that against them, whatever, and trap them into these horrible situations. And it like, I just keep thinking when I see those videos of those kids realizing like you, like there are people that have been through stuff like that before and they're not at fault for what happened to them and their, their abuser isn't like a better person because they stopped abusing them. Where we finally leave off is them leaving for the quest or well, Annabeth and Tyson coming up after Hermes drops off the two bags. And yeah. um, so yeah, the next chapter is gonna be them finally getting out to sea and all of that. Yeah, the next chapter is called um, something something Princess Andromeda, so. Yeah. That'll be Luke. Yep. The first time he tries to kill them. Oh, okay. Wearing his, so we'll have wear, to look forward to next time. Wearing his boat shoes. Hey guys, this is Shannon again. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time, we will cover the two chapters, which is, like we said, the first time they run into Luke on the Princess Andromeda. Um, feel free to review the podcast, subscribe, follow us on YouTube or our TikTok channels if you want to ever watch a live stream of us recording. Otherwise, we'll catch you next time.